So uh, this is Tenable Talk number two. Uh, so uh, anyway, we got uh, we got Paul and John. They're going to talk about bringing sexy back. Um, uh, there's a lot of people in here, um, and the, the I'll blame the hotel, but the audio is not the awesomest. I'm going to do the best I can. But if everyone could just try to be quiet, and uh, and uh, and hopefully we'll all be able to hear and uh, look forward to hearing this talk. Thank you very much. Um, so just a quick introduction. Uh, and really just some stupid slides to get everyone kind of smiling and laughing. Uh, that's me, I'm Paul Sidorian. I had a speaking handicapped one time at uh, Source Boston, so I asked you to you always apply some sort of speaking handicapped when I talk. Uh, I work for these fine folks. I'm the product evangelist, and the way that came about was I was once searching for Nessus, and I found Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Speak it, brother Asadorian. <laughs> that is uh, John Wasted Strand. Strand. Um, wait minute, notice wait the hand motions. I learned all of my product evangelism hand motions from my good friend John Strand. And by the way, if anybody here from the EFF, we're, we were obligated to say we're sorry. We're <laughs> uh, that's uh, myself and Larry doing the podcast. Notice the hand motions. It's getting it. Uh, and only when Larry and I to get are together, do I have that right shirt on? It has a writing on the back, right? Uh, are we truly fleet? Um, so that's another picture of John Strand looking at someone else's crotch. So just, <laughs> I, I don't know how that ended up in there. <laughs> I, you know, it, nothing it, attracts it, a crowd <laughs> like a crowd. If anybody knows, that's Peter Danu, and it was real, and it was spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is a Paul.com listener. That is and, not Paul. Uh, no, it's not me. It's a future Paul.com listener. Uh, and we've been corrupting the youth of America since 2005 with our weekly podcast. Um, you can hire us to do your penetration tests because we are professional, professional, responsible. And professional. And professionals. Notice that you know, we support each other when we're, we're doing things like keg stands. I think that's an important aspect of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you sir have a it's, sick mind. That is not what this game right. stand is all about. <laughs> uh, so that's our website. You can go there and get more information. But our goal is to bring sexy back. Um, and that's not how you bring sex. Is that anyone's cousin? I know we're, we're like in the South. Anyone? That's, yeah. No, that's uh, yeah, that's doing it wrong. Uh, so one of the goals of this presentation is John and I had a lot of conversations about, you know, we do all these penetration tests, they're successful, we'll talk a little bit about that. But let's have a conversation that matters and really not just go, wow, we can find a vulnerability in that and that's really cool and there's not much you can do about it from a defensive standpoint. So the goal is to have a discussion that matters, unlike a giant robot, a ninja, and a pirate get into a fight, who really wins? Maybe we can have that discussion afterwards. Usually at this point someone shouts out, ninja or a robot! Wait, we should do it quick. How many ninjas do we have in the room? Kevin. <laughs> we have one. We have one. How many people consider themselves to be pirates? What do you consider a Viking? Vikings. <laughs> Vikings. Somebody said my mom. <laughs> nice, nice. Dude, she says hi, by the way. So, <laughs> so uh, that's the outline for today. We're going to talk about uh, UDA uh, and how you can do things like hacking back, hopefully without getting arrested. We'll look at some case studies. I've got some updated information on one of the case studies. I actually talked to the defense attorney on one of the case studies that we've had in this presentation for a while, so that's kind of interesting. Then we'll talk about warning banners and the three ways in which you can do things like hacking back, but in the context of annoyance, attribution, and attack. So, yes, I did say hacking back. Please do not run away. Um, I'll take this one. Go ahead with the disclaimer. All right. Yeah. So in this room, we're going to discuss it as hacking back, just to be blunt. Whenever you guys actually go forth and you start talking to your management about some of the techniques that we're talking about, do not discuss it in terms of hacking back. And don't mention our names. Yeah, don't mention our names either. <laughs> odds are, odds are they have a CISSP, and I know a lot of people in here have CISSPs, and we all had to like drill it into our minds. I'm not supposed to hack back. I'm not supposed to hack back. I'm not supposed to hack back. So while we're going through the presentation, we'll come up with some creative ways of calling it other things and some creative ways of doing it. However, as far as a disclaimer, the contents of this presentation may get you into trouble. As we said, conventional wisdom says everything we're going to talk about is a bad idea, but it's a lot of fun and we have to start thinking about these concepts if we want to progress as far as security. 
So first off, why are we talking about hacking back? You know, John and I talked about a lot of defensive measures and things we can do basically to improve the recommendations to our customers to say, hey, we just broke into your network. Let's arm you with stuff that can actually stop attackers. Um, so that's how it started. Um, so what we realized you was the box off. That, um, <laughs> <laughs> that penetration tests are successful. If you poll penetration testers and you ask them, how much of a percentage of your penetration tests are successful versus not, right? Most people are like 100%, 99%. All of their penetration tests are successful. Um, I mean, it, it also, we asked them, you know, how many women you dated and how many women you slept with, and it was the same ratio, which was kind of weird. Kind of odd. Um, but, so most penetrations are successful. So we said, well, why? Let's look into why penetration tests are successful. Then from there, maybe develop some mechanisms to help people with the defense. So it really boils down to a couple of uh, quick things why I think we're always so successful. Flimsy defensive layers, right? Firewalls have holes, and antivirus software does not. Does anyone have problems with antivirus software on pen tests? No? I do. Sometimes anyway. it just gets in the way. It's like, oh, McAfee, you got me today. <laughs> Um, so those are really easy layers to get around. The social engineering, of course, you add a splash of social engineering into your penetration testing engagements. And I mean, that's hugely successful. I mean, we've all done it right. Spear phishing, targeted spear phishing. Um, passwords, that's, I mean, this is kind of one of my most favorite things. I mean, we've got lots of tools and scripts built around finding default passwords, easily guessable passwords. Um, Passwords are, are not like underwear, because sometimes John shares his underwear with his friends, which is, I don't know. You're welcome, yeah. by the way. Yeah, anytime. Thanks. Um, so people put things, passwords like on a sticky note somewhere, um, and of course use the like weak passwords like 1234. What kind of password jackass uses his password of 1234 on his luggage? <laughs> um, software vulnerabilities. Uh, John and I, we love Adobe, as John, you can see there, by the loving expression on John's face, how much we love Adobe, because it's contributed to so many successful penetration tests. Awesome, right? There's tons of software vulnerabilities. Microsoft, uh, Oracle, I mean, you name it, that is a contributing factor to successful penetration tests. So, then we thought, we need somewhere to keep our face clean from the noodle splashes. Yeah, well, yes, we did think that. And we've had this great idea of getting this rubber shield that goes around your face, so when you eat the noodles and it splat, and it turns out Japan beat someone, us someone it. beat us to it. But right. uh, we also thought that we can do better. And what about taking, applying what we know about attack and applying it to defense? And I said, well, wait a minute, John, that's hacking back. All conventional wisdom and training tells me that that's a bad idea. And he's like, no, no, no. It's OK, Paul. And we held hands, and then we went forth, and we created a whole bunch of stuff about defensive mechanisms and using a splash of offense in your defensive mechanisms. And one of the attack models uh, we wanted to kind of model was OODA. OODA loops. So if anybody has done anything in the military, especially in the Air Force, um, the idea of OODA loops goes back to this gentleman by the name of John Boyd, who was a fighter jet pilot. And he basically realized that whatever fighter pilot that's in a confrontation, that observes, orients, decides, and acts the quickest, they get to continue breathing the next day, which is kind of a good deal if you're a fighter pilot. Um, so we basically came up with methods that if there was going to be any training, any type of mechanisms of showing people how to fly planes, by the way, he was an instructor at Top Gun, which I thought was just a bad movie, but uh, he was an instructor there. And he started training people in these methodologies. And then it got spread to other aspects of warfare as well. Even the Marines use a different, uh, different form of it. And what we're talking about with defenses, if you look at observe, orient, decide, and act, attacks that are coming into your networks today, what is the ability for us to observe attacks that are coming in? The attacker's getting better and better at bypassing existing security controls, like IDS, IPS. If we talk about attackers that are attacking over SSL and back channels over SSL, we have very little t ability to observe. We're talking about orienting ourselves to these attacks, well, if we don't see them, usually the only indication that we have that we were actually compromised was after the compromise. And it really sucks whenever your first line of notification is the resulting fraud. And I'm looking at Heartland for this one. Now, we make lots of decisions in computer security. We buy a lot of stuff. And a lot of those decisions are poor decisions. If you look at compliance, a lot of the compliance standards that are out there, there's a tremendous amount of things that you're supposed to adhere to. But if you think about it, if anybody does pen testing, a lot of those things don't really get in the way all that much. So what we need is a new model for defense that actually allows us to get in the OTA loop of the attackers so we can have a better approach at identifying the attacks and, more importantly, messing with the attackers' OTA loops. Yeah. Uh, and usually the act part, I find, uh, really just means panic. <laughs> 
Uh, so Sorry. let's talk about some. Uh, did you want me to talk more about that slide? Or no, let's no, move through. Throwing sand in people's faces, through. that's fun. Yeah. Uh, case studies. Um, we've just got a couple. We've tru tru uh, pruned it down to just a couple of case studies. So this case was the US versus Jerome Hackenkamp. And uh, Jerome was doing a lot of nasty, bad things and using the university network to do that. He was also the person that got uh, in trouble for hacking eBay and a bunch of other sites. And um, so what happened was this university, uh, they, I don't think it was police, I think it was actually a university yeah. administrator or a security professional, uh, kind of went home one night and said, you know, I've got this guy, he's hacking around on my network, we've gotten a lot of complaints from these big organizations saying that this person's hacking into my network, I, I have the ability to log into his workstation and collect evidence. By the way, his password and user ID, temp, temp. So, the university administrator did that, logged into Jerome's workstation and captured information. And the information he captured was the IP address and MAC address pairing because Jerome was changing his IP address um, to try and mask where he was on the network. So university administrator logs in, collects that evidence. The judge says, hey, that evidence is admissible in court. Now, it brings up a lot of interesting questions, right? So some people said, well, the university acceptable use policy says that that's OK. Well, I mean, if that were the case, I could put something up on my website that says, hey, anyone that visits my website, I'm going to break into your computer system, and that's OK, because you accepted my usage policy. I mean, if that was really the case, we could just take the Fourth Amendment and just throw it right out the window, right? We don't need that. Oh, the FBI can search my computer because I used the network that you know, they were on, and now they can search my computer. The reason I know a little more about this case was because we had Jennifer Granick on the podcast. And Jennifer was the defense attorney for Jerome Hackenkamp um, and said, you know, this was a unique case where this evidence was admitted into court. So it was kind of a word of caution to us to say, you know, we can't just go logging into people's systems and taking information and saying, hey, look, it'll get accepted in court. It was kind of a unique situation because of other circumstances that were surrounding the case. So then I asked Jennifer, I said, what happened to Jerome Hackenkamp? And she said, well, he decided to, um, that he didn't like the way things were going. I mean, he had Jennifer Granick as his attorney. I don't understand what his problem was, but says, you know, I'm going to represent myself. And I said, Jennifer, do you ever recommend that people represent themselves? Because that, that doesn't really sound like a good idea. And she said, I I'll give everyone some free legal advice. She's like, this is just my opinion. Never ever represent yourself, <laughs> but she's a lawyer, right? Uh, so she is biased. But Jerome did spend an extra 10 months um, in prison awaiting trial with no attorney, whereas if he had an attorney um, that was helping the process along, his family finally did get him an attorney, and they ended up settling out of court. So this is kind of a case where it could be OK, depending on the circumstances, uh, to do something like this. Um, and here's another case that's really interesting. Whenever we're talking about gaining access to computers, if you guys look at botnets and talk about, I know that there's people in this room that like infiltrating botnets, taking over and probably eradicating botnets, and that's fun. That's really cool. Well, apparently Microsoft has the exact same hobby. Um, one of the earlier cases, and if you guys look at the news, Microsoft has been basically counter-exploiting systems that are infected with botnets. And the reason why I say counter-exploiting is if I am in control of a bot, and Microsoft gains control of that bot. Basically, Microsoft is in violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It's just gained access to a bunch of people's computer systems without authorization. However, if we go back to 2000, uh, 2010, Microsoft got a court order. It's called an ex parte injunction. That means that the people that you're going up against cannot come to court to degrade the botnet. Now, they did some interesting things. First, they actually went over and they shut down the DNS servers, which is pretty cool. The other technical measures is extremely interesting because they actually infiltrated the botnet, i.e. took over these computer systems and removed the bots from all of these different systems that were compromised. So you can see how that's really kind of walking on that gray line, but we're starting to see this more and more. Google just, or not Google, Microsoft uh, recently did this, I believe last week with another botnet, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, and then earlier this week, of course, they eradicated Google Chrome. Now that doesn't really have that much <laughs> to do with this. But the point is, Microsoft is getting authorization, working very closely with the federal authorities to break into people's computer systems. There's really no other way that you can slice this, breaking into other people's computer systems for the purposes of eradicating malware from their computer systems. So like I said, there's a lot of interesting case studies, whether or not I have the authorization to do that or not, I don't know. Now a couple things, I'm not a lawyer, but let's pretend. 
Everyone close your eyes, imagine. Hold okay, your wake hands up now. together, click your heels together. Three John's times. a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Um, so Ben Wright, a, a really good friend of mine who is an attorney, uh, said that any time an organization tries to implement anything like this, that there is cutting edge technology or approaches, there's a couple things you can do that if things go wrong, you can protect yourself. First and foremost, discuss it. Make sure this isn't something that you do in the, in the dark of night. You don't let your CIOs, your CFOs know, or other people in your organization know. Make sure it's discussed, and make sure you document what it is you discussed. What is your plan? How are you planning on doing it? Why are you planning on doing it? You talked with your own legal counsel. And then also make a plan. We'll talk more about doing plans and doing it successfully. But it all starts with conversations starting to consult with others. Don't just try to implement this or you will get into a lot of trouble. Another rule of thumb, don't be evil. I don't know if we cut it from the slide deck, uh, but a month ago uh, there was an interesting case where somebody purchased a stolen computer system and the people that owned the computer could gain access to it. They started taking screenshots with that computer. Some of those screenshots were less than flattering and the judge in that case basically ruled that you do not have authorization to break back into your own computer system. If somebody else is using it, you will be in violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act as well. And now, the pictures that they took, this lady was naked, and I think in the article, and even in the legal document, it said open crotch shots, which I didn't know that that was a legal term. <laughs> but, but we're, is we're that cool like an that. open source? Oh, open <laughs> source. <laughs> All right, um, so go ahead. So, um, the, what, do what, to, what do we, yeah, warning, okay. you know what, talk about warning banners. Okay, so warning yeah. banners. Now, whenever we're looking at the Hack and Camp case, when we're talking about the Hack and Camp, you just had to get off the open source comment as quickly as possible. Yes, yes. When we're talking about the Hack and Camp case, there's a couple of things that make that interesting. First, the exigency of the circumstances, which meant that the evidence could very easily disappear. The judge ruled that that particular attack or gaining access to that student system was okay because the evidence may disappear. The other reason was the student signed an acceptable use document that basically said you're on our university network and one of the lines in that document said the university would take reasonable measures to protect their network and the judge ruled that gaining access to a student's computer was within those bounds. Now whether or not that's the case going forward I severely expect that that will change in the future We're talking with Jennifer as well but look at your warning banners. Your warning banners state this is my boundary. If you come into my boundary certain things will occur. For example, we'll discuss this here in a little bit. How many of you guys have VPN servers, remote VPN servers? OK. Now, how many of your VPN servers do you do security checks to validate the security controls of a system before they log in? So if you did that to an attacker who tried to gain access to your system, would you be violating the law? I doubt it. But if you think about the information you'd gather, you'd gather their IP address, their security settings, like what antivirus are they running? Are they up to date on patches? Maybe the users that exist on that system? You would not be violating laws by doing that on your own people. So what we're saying is if you're going to implement this, make sure it's consistent and you're using it in such a way that you can get the level of evidence that's required to start prosecuting people. All right, so Eric needed a warning about it. This one's all you, it involves a crutch and a knife. Yeah, so uh, what, what does a crutch, a knife, and some duct tape have to do with it? Um, we go to our good friend, uh, Eric Stetz. So Eric was kind of this paranoid person, um, not, not very smart about being paranoid about someone breaking into his house and thought that getting a rubber band and then taking a kitchen knife and duct taping it to a crutch was a great way to set a trap for people that were going to be entering his home without authorization. Well, it turns out that Eric uh, was renting the apartment and his landlord needed to come in to like let the gas meter guy in or some kind of repair man opens the door and this lethal weapon just comes flying at him. Now, what I envision happening is the crutch standing up, and as the door opens, it just kind of falling over <laughs> and sticking in the floor. Um, fortunately, no one was harmed in the incident. However, um, Eric was charged with reckless endangerment for a vicious-looking booby trap. It's pretty, pretty vicious-looking, huh? Open um, crotch shots in this. You're learning all kinds of legal terminology so today. The, the example here is that this translates into the physical world, too. And if we think of the things we're going to talk about today, and how they translate into the physical world, it'll help us put some controls around it in the computer or virtualized world. So, you know, putting up a booby trap like this is probably a bad idea, right? He should have had a warning banner, right? I mean, if he had this warning banner, <laughs> it would have been okay. Could we make it shorter, right? Though, Paul? I, you know, I, what about that warning <laughs> banner? I mean, would that <laughs> help? <laughs> I, I don't know. So. 
Yeah, don't be, you know, dumb moves like knives and crutches and vasectomy is probably a bad idea. Um, you know, the, and the warning here is just to not do anything like monumentally stupid. If you're going to put malware inside of a Word document and track who opens it and collect information, you want to do that in a controlled manner. You just want to don't go off and do that in a bubble without telling anyone um, and, and that kind of thing. And so also, we've got smarter yeah, options, right? Annoyance, attribution, and attack. And also, if you do set up malware, and we're going to talk about some ways that you can do that, make it hard to get to. Because mm -hmm. if the bad guys find out that you're hosting malware on your website, they're going to start redirecting users to your malware, so you start compromising other people. Make it a little harder to get to. So annoyance. Um, so this is Honeyports. I was working with Mick Douglas on this uh, about a year ago. And uh, we wanted to come up with a, just a really, really easy way from the command line, where you could set up a port that as soon as it was communicated with, with a full TCP connect, it would actually blacklist the IP. Now, the TCP connect is important because we don't want people spoofing IP addresses from Google, updates.microsoft.com, and all of a sudden creating a DOS condition on our own network. So what we have is a couple of scripts. This one's from Windows, where you can go through and run this script, put it in a batch file, run the script, and if anybody touches, in this situation, port 3333 makes a full established connection, it'll automatically add a rule set to the firewall that'll blacklist them. Now, we have the exact same thing for Linux as well. We worked on both of them. I know we had a bunch of people from Paul.com helping out to make it as efficient as possible. But this is just a trick to really piss off an attacker. Now, one of my friends was actually under a, what we call a hostile penetration test. What had happened, they had an East Coast and a West Coast knock. And they were basically going to fight it out to see which knock would continue. Because they were going to have the, that knock take over operations for the entire United States. And they said, well, we're having a pen tester come in to see our security stance. So we fired this up on all of their Windows systems. We also fired it up on all of their Linux computer systems. And quickly, pen tester scans, sin scans, sees tons of servers, tons of ports, does a little happy dance, starts doing full connect scans, doing Nessus scans, doing full connects with the Nmap. And all of a sudden, the entire network goes dark. Everything disappears. Now, if you're doing a pen test and everything disappears, what's the first thing that goes through your head? Crap. Crap. Why? <laughs> I just crashed the network, right? It's the first thing that happened is they thought they crashed the network. So they get on the phone and like, holy crap, we just crashed the network. I'm like, no, our servers are fine, dude. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> and they called up again and they're like, well, did you, did, you, did you blacklist our IP addresses? Well, not exactly. Carry on. They lost half a day trying to figure out what exactly had gone on. And they said, could you please remove this so we can scan the rest of your network? And they said, absolutely cool. We will reduce the overall security of our environment to make your pen test easier. You just need to document that we did that. They won in that situation. <laughs> so here's the Linux one. Yeah. All right, this next one is Paul's annoyance. Yeah, uh, the, actually, the original author was Josh Wright, um, who posted to the Paul.com mailing list. And I modified it. And essentially, what it does is uh, when an attacker visits uh, this web page, and I, we trip it from robots.txt. You'll hear us talk about that a little bit. And we've got some real world examples of you know, a robots.txt. It says disallow forward slash admin. It takes them to this page. Um, and it says, hey, you tripped my honeypot. Um, you found the secret page. Now your IP address has been blacklisted, and you need to email me to get unblacklisted. Uh, when in reality, I'm just messing with them. I haven't really blacklisted this is their IP address. I just want to try and get them to see if they'll send me an email. And you, know, you can log their IP address and their user agent. So I get interesting things. Like one day I was like, wow, I set that up a year ago. There's got to be some interesting things in my inbox. <laughs> And lo and behold, um, we get this really fun uh, message from this one IP address that uh, came to the honeypot three different times um, in the same day. And the first time they came, their user agent was IE6, which is kind of weird. Do attackers really use IE6? I don't know. No, um, IE7. Then it comes back the same day with IE7. I'm like, well, wait a minute here. I'm like, did he use a different computer? Did he upgrade? Is there a proxy? Did anyone else want to speculate? I mean, this is just kind of a fun slide. We can make stuff up, solar flares, whatever you want. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, it was just kind of a fun thing of someone kind of getting stuck in one of uh, the honeypot traps. Um, the other thing that uh, we've talked about is finding vulnerabilities in penetration testers' tools or attackers' tools, and then building into your websites, in this example, Vulnerab uh, those uh, exploits for those tools. So, I mean, you could take one of these tools and reverse engineer it and, and look for the vulnerability that way. I'm lazy. So, what I did was I used Google and I found all of the you know, reports of vulnerabilities in these various uh, tools. 
And then I said, well, someone could very easily build that into um, the site. And I think someone's done that. I don't know if yeah. we've opened the example in. Someone's got a. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Pots of Gold, uh, Pots Andrew of gold. Wilson. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing that we found out running this and a lot of different things is we've noticed that a lot of pen testers and web pen testers don't update their tools. It's like, oh, I bought it in 2009. It still must be good. Um, so it's not all uncommon to find vulnerabilities in these products. Also, a lot of these products are pirated out on BitTorrent. I know it. I know you guys are probably a bit shocked about that. But you can <laughs> find these products, and usually they're older versions that have not been updated as well. Yeah, this one's kind of fun, too, with WebInspect. Um, the scans run fine, but when they go to generate the report, it crashes, which I think is kind of fun to mess with someone. All right, this one's oh. mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's all. Dude. It's all. It's um, David Hasselhoff. I know it's David Hasselhoff. It's disturbing. <laughs> All right. So the next thing that we wanted to play with is, is messing with Attacker's Day and, of course, audience members as well. Infinite recursive directories. Now, these tricks have been around for a long time. Uh, basically, you can create a junction directory or you can create a symlink to a directory. So whenever it goes in, it references itself. So if you're going through and you're doing a script that infinitely goes through the directories or recursively goes through the directories, it tends to get stuck at that point. And we want to do a special shout out to Mark Baggett for helping out with this one. Go to the next one. Oh, so, that's not Mark, that's Mark Baggett? That is Mark Baggett oh, right okay. there. That is Mark Excellent. Baggett. Excellent. Um, the, the hot Mark Baggett. So what I did is I just made a directory called go away. I went into go away and I basically created an MK link or a symbolic link for dir1 in go away. Now if you run it, the first time you run it, it fails. Why does it fail? Does anyone know? If I go through and do dir space forward slash ask and it'll go through recursively and look at it, it stops. Why did it stop? Well, no, it, it'll, it'll hit once, and then again and again and again, but after a while, it fails. Does anybody know why it fails? Now, look what's happening to the directory name. 256. Awesome. So how we fix that is we create another link called dir2 in the exact same directory. Next slide. And it works like a champ. What happens is if you do a recursive lookup in that directory, a recursive search in that directory, it goes to the first link, fails, then goes to the second link, fails, goes to the first link, fails, and it goes back and forth forever. So what are the impacts of this? Well, if we were to say something like there was a certain type of threat that would be advanced that I wouldn't say because we'd all have to drink in this room if we said it, a lot of times those types of attackers will go through and search for documents, right? This is a way that if they have an automated script that'll go through and search for those director search directories, you can get them caught in a trap. Going back to Oda loops, if a bad guy breaks into your system, you've now created a way that he can light himself up like a Roman candle. Now you have a better ability to observe him. Another interesting trick with this, if you run Meterpreter and you have it, it recursively go through directories looking for files, Meterpreter will get stuck. Even if you kill your session, Meterpreter will continue to run on the system, trying to recursively go through all those directories. It's just a nice way, yet again, to annoy attackers to set up just an recursive directory. Next one. Uh, so now we're going to talk about. These slides uh, will be available, so you guys can play with them at home, too. <laughs> yeah, uh, setting traps. Uh, this is something that uh, we've worked on for quite some time. Is Ben Jackson here? Uh, I don't know if Ben is here. Uh, have you seen him? But, John, you did the initial version, so yeah, why don't you so take this slide? Myself and in Ethan Robish created a little script called Spider Trap. It's a little Python script that, as soon as you go to it, it gives you four links. If you click on any of the links, it gives you four more random links. If you click on any of those four links, it gives you four more random links, and it works indefinitely um, until you actually kill your crawler. And the idea is, once again, messing with an attacker's ability to observe your network. If a web attacker is coming in, they're going to try to go through and crawl your directory structure, right? So what we want to do is find a way, very similar to infinitely recursive directories on a file system, do it on the web. So as soon as they hit those directories, their tool is going to get caught up in this. Now, this is not designed to stop attackers like Kevin Johnson at Secure Ideas, just throwing a shout out to Secure Ideas. This is designed to catch those people that are just blindly coming into your network, just trying to give us a little bit better ability to observe them. So I wanted to show you a couple things. It is David Bowie approved. So if we go through and actually start hitting what we call Web Labyrinth. Web Labyrinth is a full PHP implementation oh, of Spider Trap. That slide. Now, this is the slide right here. And if you look, it says, it says randomly generate an error just to keep it real. So we got random chance, 0 out of 100. It says the error chance equals 16, 404 not found, error chance 23. It says it's forbidden. My favorite is 40, 42. It says just for the Whiskey Tango fact, uh, Foxtrot factor, payment required. <laughs> Just to mess with the attackers. Also, if, you're, if your agent string is coming in as Googlebot, it'll basically tell you to go away. It'll tell you to go away. So this is something you'd want to put in robots.txt, telling the good crawlers, don't go there. But you know the bad guys, as soon as we see robots.txt, what, what do we do? Pen testers, bad people, we're going to go right to that directory. 
Yeah, and I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, result. If you were to start sending back random um, HTTP responses, that would really mess with your web application testing tools. Yeah. Big time. I think we actually have some of that. Um, so here's wget. Um, one of my friends had a pen t web pen test coming up, and he decided to set this up just to figure out how it would work. So the pen tester did what a lot of bad web pen testers does, sets up the crawler and the scanner at 9 o'clock at night, and then goes to bed. Why? Because that's the way a lot of us work, because crawling websites sucks, and that's a long, long time. Wakes up the next morning, and his Windows box is blue screened. <laughs> Completely crashed it. So then he fires up wget, goes over to a Linux box, fires up wget. Now when wget goes to a directory, what does it do? Saves a little file, right? So he set that up, went to lunch, came back, completely filled up the hard drive on his system, and crashed his box there as well. So just trying to create a little bit of mess. Now here's uh, w3af, next slide. It'll go through and start scanning. It quickly jumps out, says it's found 60%, and then it starts running slower and slower and slower Yeah, and the, slower. the bar actually like moves down, and it's like, oh yeah, you're almost done. Then it's like, oh, nope, just kidding. You still got a way longer <laughs> to go. Noticed, oh wait, wait, I'm almost done. Noticed, nope, just it kidding. never goes backwards, ever. <laughs> this bar never goes backwards, it just keeps going. And by the way, some updates to Web Labyrinth and Spider Trap. Spider Trap, you can give it the option of actually feeding it a file of a whole bunch of directories. So you can take Durbuster, its default directory listing, Feed that into Spider Trap, and it'll just start feeding up all the directories that Durbuster is looking for. Well, that's a Web good Labyrinth, you can feed it in an arbitrary file. One of my favorites, of course, is the default. It's Alice in the Wonderland. Different words will be highlighted. So this um, is you. Yeah, so we set this up. Uh, we set up a labyrinth on one of our websites a while back, and we've got some interesting stuff in it. Um, slash admin on the server gets redirected to the Web Labyrinth uh, trap. And uh, you know, I get some interesting. Um, uh, user agent strings in here. This user agent string said, made by ZMEU at white hat team, www.whitehat.ro. Can someone go there now and tell me what, what that site is? Anyone <laughs> want to try? No? Uh, no? Seriously, don't go there. Uh, unless you want malware. Just a nice guy uh, saying hi. Yeah. Uh, so I looked into this user agent string because they were telling me something about the attackers that were coming at my site. It turns out ZMEU is a, um, a really popular like, little script that attackers are using for going and finding some low-hanging fruit within the websites. And the reason I found out about this was because it fell into my trap. Um, so this is like a, an obscure uh, custom script that attackers wrote uh, and puts that uh, entry in your logs. Um, I, I kind of think that you know, maybe this will help the internet be a better place, right? If this tool can fall into my trap and spin its wheels spending time trying to you know, do nothing on my website, that's less time it's spending on your websites. And if we all set this up and it falls into all of our traps, we're just going to really mess with the attackers on a larger scale. So I'm kind of optimistic. I like to think it, it makes the world a better place. You know, the more I looked into um, this uh, user agent string, I also saw it associated with woot woot at blackhats.romanianantisec smiley face. Now I'm not sure if the attackers are smiling at me, we're smiling at them, we're all smiling together, it's happy time, unicorns, rainbows. That's not um, awkward. But, um, you know, and antisec is obviously one of the movements that was against sites that uh, talk about software vulnerabilities, exploits, and exploitation techniques. Does that sound like Paul.com just a little? Uh, so uh, that made me kind of, kind of scared. Yeah, so you see the woot woot uh, of, a lot. One of my favorite quotes about offensive countermeasures is I was presenting in Virginia Beach right before the hurricane hit, and uh, Josh Wright was in the audience, and his quote was awesome. Uh, to me, outside, he said, I effing hate you guys. I hate you. Uh, because he had been on a couple of pen tests where they set this up in the environment, and he's like, it doesn't really stop me. It just takes more of my time. And he made a really good point as kind of a plea. If you guys are implementing this, that's great. For the higher level pen test, that's awesome. See if the pen testers catch it. But his point was valid. He said, if you're having a pen tester come in to try to find your real vulnerabilities, you may want to let them know about mm. these things up front. Because the goal of a pen test is to find vulnerabilities, right? I mean, the goal of a pen test is to find those vulnerabilities. We don't always want to mess with pen testers, just sometimes. So I, I take that as a great endorsement for offensive countermeasures. In a nice hat, too. In a nice hat. <laughs> OK, uh, attribution. All right, so word web bugs was something that was kind of fun. Basically, a lot of people don't know this, but you can put HTML code right into a Word doc. 
Now, some people are like, well, I can copy and paste it in. No, that's different. You can embed HTML code, and Word will render it. Word will render it for you. Now, this is regardless of whether or not you have uh, VBScript enabled, whether or not you have macros enabled. Just simply having Word, opening it up, will actually trigger it. So we wanted to show you what it, what it actually looks like. So this is something that was in Core Impact. However, you guys can implement it for free. We've actually got a full write-up on how to do that at offensivecountermeasures.com. But whenever you make the connection, check out the user agent string. What is that from? See the last line? MS Office 12. So Microsoft Word made the outbound connection. Now, how could you guys implement this? What you guys would do is set it up in your environment where you have this HTML embedded on your critical documents, your critical intellectual property. So if anybody moved that document someplace else, it would simply try to make a GET request to your site for maybe a one pixel by one pixel GIF. You're not hacking anyone's system. You're not breaking into anyone's system. You're just having your Word doc make a callback so you can track where your critical intellectual property is. Now, we played around with this. And the interesting thing is it works on Word for Windows, of course. It also works on Word for Mac. And it also works on text edit for Mac. And if you convert the Word document to a PDF, it also still works. Um, the final thing that we finally got working is we got something very similar for open office documents, that if you open it in open office, open office makes the connection as well. Once again, we're not hacking anybody. We're just trying to get attribution as far as who they are and where they're at. What happens if you run strings? What happens if you run strings? You will see it. <laughs> What strings? No. <laughs> right, this one's yours. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of some of the things I've been setting up in uh, the robots.txt. I set up an admin.php application. And one of the goals is to draw attackers to something that looks real, right? We, we want to build a matrix. We want to build uh, the inception, build the dream world for the attacker. So I started playing around with making a small little login application that we can do things and embed things in. We can put beef inside of this login page, right? And so we put again, it in the disallow statement so that people find it. Then we code up a little PHP script, and we include a beef hook inside there. And remember, uh, this is all about using the tools we use as pen testers against the bad guys. Yeah, so um, now when we hook an attacker's browser with beef, we can use the functionality with beef to do things, like redirect their browser to your competitions. Not that we would ever endorse that. Um, but you know, we can detect their host name. We can see if they're running Tor. And the feature that I like best is if an attacker visits this site, I hook their browser with beef, I can grab their visited URL history. Now I can see what other sites they may have been trying to get into on my own domain, and also what other sites they're hacking into. And if they're using a browser to send some strings and it ends up in their browser history, now I can see potentially what attacks are being sent at me and other similar targets. So I think that's a really useful level of reconnaissance. All right, another thing is the decloak engine from Metasploit. We'll go through these kind of quick. Uh, decloak was a really cool project, had some really interesting things like the ability to detect Tor. One of the ways to do that, if the browser is going through Tor, the browser can start other applications like Java. It can start Word. It can start iTunes. And the goal is, if they're using proxy chains or they're using Tor for the browser, maybe these other applications won't go through Tor. So if they connect to us, we can get them to connect back with other applications. So we took the decloak engine and we redid it. And uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide. It has the capability of logging to a database. So you can see that people are making connections back with Java, HTTP, UDP. And notice how it can set their actual IP address, their internal IP address, and their external IP address. This is important for differentiating whenever somebody is attacking behind an RFC 1918 um, address space, like a university. They're hacking through a firewall. Well, the attack is going to appear to come from the university. So this allows to get the university IP and their internal IP address as well. So we went through and we updated the decloak engine with some newer Flash objects to make it more compatible with newer versions of Flash. Uh, so we started to think about what some wireless countermeasures would be. Uh, and you know, after going through lots of scenarios that really wouldn't work, um, we came up with this potential scenario. I haven't known of anyone that set this up yet, um, but I think it would be an interesting experiment to set up a, a hidden SSID Right? I think that would be enough to hide this from regular users, right? because you don't want your regular users stumbling into uh, your wireless honeypot, as it were. So call it private or guest, or Hacking my right. one that I use at home now, which I love, and I, I don't think many of my neighbors get it, is stay off my channel. Um, 
So use a captive portal when people connect to it, right? So captive portal is a standard wireless technology. What does it do? You open up a web browser, and it takes them to a web page. Well, we just showed how you can use beef and other measures inside of a web page. So on a wireless network, we can take people to a page, maybe hook their browsers with beef, collect information about the attackers using dissolvable agents. Then, optionally, we can ban their Wi-Fi uh, MAC address on the wireless network. Now they could always change it, but you know, we've collected information about that host already. So I think that's a neat project that um, we want to uh, implement and uh, actually test out. So like I said, make sure your SSID has, um, you know, is far away from anything else as possible. You don't want attackers to find this hidden SSID and then use it to break into the rest of your network. You don't want them to use your beef server against you, um, that kind of thing. Or if you're using Metasploit, to use a Metasploit server against you. Um, and, and make sure that this stuff isn't a, a jumping off point. You have to be very careful how you architect the network. If you're going to allow attackers to connect to your wireless network, this should be something that's totally separate. Um, the other one thing on this slide I did want to uh, leave was a Bluetooth canary. Like I think it would be really cool to leave some Bluetooth phones around um, and let attackers think that they're breaking into the Bluetooth phones and downloading an address book and then calling the numbers in there. Put all the numbers in there, really go to your extension so the attackers always call you. I call that the Bluetooth canary. Um, so here's a sneak preview, preview of a trap. Um, that we set up. I coded a little uh, PHP application, just gives a username and password. No matter what username or password you put in, it takes you to a page that says login failed, please try again. Clicking that link takes you back to the login uh, page. So I collected a whole bunch of um, usernames and passwords inside of a file. Now, I haven't released it or done anything else with it because I want to make sure that there's nothing that can be in this code and used to attack me. So the code's going to be a lot tighter. It was kind of just an experiment. However, after talking about this in various places, we found, uh, where's this from? This is, uh, this is Norway. in Norway. This yeah. is the equivalent of the Norway IRS website. Um, and that sounds really, really, really shady and cool. But in Norway, everyone's tax records are a public record. So you can put in a name for people, and it'll tell you how much money they made, which is neat. If you put in Chuck Norris, it says, you do not search for Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris finds you. Next one. <laughs> <coughs> so here, you got robots.txt. If we're web pen testers, we're, we're going to go right to admin, right? So you go to admin. You get type in admin and admin. The next slide. They get login. 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 Does anybody know what that says in Norwegian? <laughs> He's actually reading it. Trod to Vikiti. It basically says, did you really think it was going to be so easy? Next slide. <laughs> and it Rick rolls you. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> so we've got to move. To okay. Go uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, uh, Java attack payload, John. Okay, so with the Java attack payload, this is actually going on full attack. If you want, you could set up a directory you wouldn't want the attacker slash victim to go to, and as soon as they do, they get a little Java pop-up. We're all familiar with the social engineering toolkit, at least I hope we are, so next slide. So let's say you ran this, a bad guy would run this. Do you think a bad guy would click run? I think they would. I actually see a lot of firewalls that do the exact same pop-up again and again just for connecting to the VPN. And they're going to run that app. Next slide. I mean, as a penetration tester, when, you've got, when you have to test a site, if you browse and find something interesting, like something in slash admin, and it says, hey, do you want to run this Java program so you can interact you with whatever this is, you're going to run twice. it. <laughs> and if it's us or someone that has implemented this, they're going to get shell on your box on the penetration testers box. Yeah, exactly. Now, we'd want to be careful with that. Maybe let the pen testers know. Because um, as pen testers, we wouldn't keep previous pen test data on the system, right? No. All right, so trivia from Paul. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I just got a little trivia, kind of my favorite ways in which um, characters in a movie or TV, because that was the other scenario that I had uh, for these kinds of attacks was, um, one, you know, you're um, setting it up to maybe trip up pen testers or attackers, or you have permission from law enforcement to actually put malware or a backdoor shell on someone's system. The other scenario is, is if you're writing a plot for TV in movies. Um, so can anyone name that film? 
Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, very good. Normally I would give you something, but I, I don't. We got nothing. We I got don't. stickers, right? We have stickers, yeah. <laughs> um, so she plants a back door on a reporter system, which gives her remote access to see what's happening on a screen and also download information. Now, she's not using this to be malicious in the movie. She's using it to defend herself. So I thought that was kind of an interesting usage of Shell. Um, we're out of time right now, so we won't get to play Name That uh, movie, anymore. movie Anymore. Precautions in usage. Um, shameless plug, we are teaching, uh, John's teaching the class, offensive countermeasures, a two-day class at SANS. You can register, not today, yeah, but so pretty soon. SANS Orlando 2012. 12. 2012. Sorry. That's yeah, 2012. it's two days. We actually have seven labs per day. There's a lot of hands-on doing the exact stuff that we talked about. And we wanted to leave you guys with a happy, happy ending. ending. And the ladies in the room may be like, well, that's just sexist. We gave you David Hasselhoff earlier. We have to balance <laughs> it up. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, shit. We have so much.